Hello, um, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Narwani. I'm an endocrinologist with Valley Medical Group, and the title of my talk today is, Is It Your Thyroid? So I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So these are the objectives of my talk. I want to explain what the thyroid does and how it works, discuss the signs and symptoms of an underactive and overactive thyroid, review diagnostic tests that your doctor may perform, and review possible treatment strategies as guided by national guidelines. So first, I want to start off by talking a little bit about the physiology of the thyroid. So the thyroid is a butterfly-shaped gland that sits at the base of the neck. It sits below the larynx, the voice box. It makes um, thyroid hormone. It makes T4 and T3. 90% of the thyroid hormone it makes is T4, 10% is T3. T4 can then be converted to T3 in your peripheral tissues, in your liver, kidneys, muscles. Um, thyroid hormone affects every um, multiple organs in the body. It affects the heart, it affects the brain, it affects the nervous system, affects the bones, the GI system, and your metabolism. I also want to mention the parathyroid glands. So as you can see here in the picture, there are these small four P-shaped glands that kind of sit behind the thyroid. They have nothing to do with the thyroid. They get their name give, given their location, that they sit in close proximity to the thyroid. But the parathyroid glands make parathyroid hormone, which control calcium metabolism. Just to go again in a little bit more detail, here you have the thyroid gland. It makes thyroid hormone, T4 and T3. That gets secreted into the bloodstream, and then the cells take up these thyroid hormones. So you can see here T3 enters the cells. Um, T4 also enters the cells, but the cells convert the T4 into T3. T3 will then go bind its receptors and will call and plays a role in affecting growth and metabolism. So to make thyroid hormone, the thyroid gland takes up iodine. It's the only organ in the body to use iodine. Iodine is necessary for thyroid hormone production. And in fact, the four in T4 stands for four iodine molecules that are bound, and the three stands for three iodine molecules. Iodine deficiency is a common cause of hypothyroidism in other countries, but it's very rare in the USA. The requirements for iodine is 150 micrograms daily. Iodine containing foods are milk, yogurt, cheese, fish, shellfish, eggs, meat, nuts, breads, and most fruits and vegetables. Salt and flour are also supplemented with iodine. So now I want to go into a little bit more detail with the thyroid axis. So here you see you have the pituitary gland. It's a small P-shaped gland that sits at the base of the brain, and it's considered the master regulator. It makes many hormones. One of the hormones that it makes is TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. That will tell the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone, to make T4 and T3, which will go ahead and um, play a role in growth and metabolism. So as we can see here, the production of T4 and T3 by the thyroid is under control of the pituitary gland via TSH. And we'll be talking more about TSH um, as the talk goes on. So now I want to talk about what happens when this axis goes wrong. So hypothyroidism means that the thyroid gland can't make enough thyroid hormone to keep the body running normally. So people who are hypothyroid have too little thyroid hormone in the blood. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about what are the signs and symptoms of an underactive thyroid. So when thyroid hormones are low, the body cells can't get enough thyroid hormone and the body processes start slowing down. As the body slows, you may notice weight gain, low energy levels, feeling more tired. You may notice that you're feeling cold all the time. Notice some constipation, depression. You can see hair loss and dry skin, as well as swelling in the face and legs. You can also get muscle weakness. You can have some trouble concentrating and issues with memory. Um, females can notice some abnormal periods. 
you can notice slowing of the heart of the heart rate and low blood pressure. So as we can see, the signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism are very variable and nonspecific. There are a lot of other medical conditions that can also present with these symptoms. So a lot of times, the only way to know for sure whether you have hypothyroidism is with blood tests, which we'll come to later. So there are many reasons why the cells in the thyroid gland can't make enough thyroid hormone. Here are the major causes from most common to least common. So the three most common causes are autoimmune disease, surgical removal of part or all of the thyroid gland, and radiation treatment. So in autoimmune disease, in some people's bodies, the immune system, which is supposed to protect the body from invading infections, can actually mistake the thyroid gland as an invader and can actually attack its own thyroid gland. So that leads to inflammation and destruction of thyroid cells. As you get destruction of thyroid cells, you're not able, the thyroid gland is not able to produce enough thyroid hormone and you can get an underactive thyroid. This tends to be more common in women than men. And um, it can develop suddenly or it can develop over years. The most common form of this is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You can also have, um, you can also get an underactive thyroid if you've had surgical removal of part or all of the thyroid gland. So some people with thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer, or Graves disease need to have part of their thyroid removed. If the whole thyroid gland is removed, then you will definitely become hypothyroid. If part of the gland is only removed, the part that's left may be able to compensate to make enough thyroid hormone to keep the levels normal. Um, some people with Graves disease, uh, thyroid cancer, or toxic nodules um, are also treated with radioactive iodine. People with certain head and neck cancers like lymphoma or Hodgkin's disease um, are treated with radiation. And the radioactive iodine and radi radiation can affect thyroid function, causing the thyroid not to be able to make enough thyroid hormone. Other, um, these are other causes of hypothyroidism. They're less common. One is congenital hypothyroidism. This is hypothyroidism that a baby is born with. You can also have thyroiditis. What thyroiditis is, it's inflammation of the thyroid gland. It's usually caused by a viral infection. So when you get a thyroiditis, you get inflammation and destruction of the cells usually transient, and eventually people can recover their thyroid function. There's certain medications that can also cause um, the thyroid to not function properly, and those medications are amiodarone, lithium, interferon alpha, and interleukin-2. Getting, as we mentioned, iodine is very important for thyroid hormone production, so getting too much or too little iodine can also if, um, affect how, how much thyroid hormone the gland, the thyroid gland is able to make. Damage to the pituitary is another cause of hypothyroidism. As we discussed, the pituitary gland is the master gland. It tells the thyroid how much hormone to make. So when the pituitary gland is damaged by tumor, radiation, or surgery, it may no longer be able to give the thyroid instructions and the thyroid may stop making enough thyroid hormone. There are also rare disorders that can infiltrate the thyroid, like amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis, where they can deposit um, protein into the thyroid gland and prevent it from functioning normally. So now I wanna talk about how do we diagnose hypothyroidism with blood tests. So the most important blood test for diagnosing hypothyroidism is TSH. Um, so again, just wanted to review again. So the pituitary gland makes TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which tells the thyroid gland to make T3 and T4. In hypothyroidism, the thyroid gland is not able to make enough T3 and T4. So you'll see low levels of T3 and T4 in the blood. The brain will sense that it's gonna increase the TSH, trying to stimulate the thyroid to make more thyroid hormone. So when we see a high TSH, that means hypothyroidism. So a high TSH indicates that the thyroid gland is being asked to make more T4 because there isn't enough T4 in the blood. So again, a high TSH indicates an underactive thyroid. 
we can also check levels of T4. So 99% of T4 is bound to TBG, that um, thyroxine binding globulin. 1% of T4 is free. It's the free T4 that's available to enter cells and control growth and metabolism. So we can often measure the amount of free T4, which is the amount of unattached T4 in the blood, and that's available to get into cells. So a lot of times in hypothyroidism, we'll see low free T4 levels. We can also look for thyroid antibodies. In Hashimoto's, as we mentioned, there's inflammation in the thyroid gland. So you can see, you can see the presence of TPO and TG antibodies in the blood, which would indicate that there is some inflammation going on. In some people, there may be inflammation of the thyroid, so you may be seeing positive thyroid antibodies. However, their thyroid function, their TSH and T4 are normal. So what that means is while there is some inflammation in the thyroid, the other thyroid cells are able to compensate and make enough thyroid hormone that it's not affecting the hormone levels in the blood. So how do we treat hypothyroidism? So there is no cure for hypothyroidism, but the symptoms can be completely controlled. So what are the goals of treatment? The goals of treatment are to have people um, feel better. You want imp improvement and resolution of the symptoms and signs of the disease. It's usually treated by replacing the amount of hormone that your own thyroid can no longer make to bring your T4 and your TSH levels back to normal. And the goal is we want to avoid overtreating by giving you too much thyroid hormone because that's not good for the body either. So the mainstay of treatment is levothyroxine. What levothyroxine is, it's basically synthetic T4. It's very similar to the T4 that your thyroid makes. It's the primary source of replacement. It's very effective. It has a steady half-life. It's easy to dose, it's safe, it's low cost, and it's pretty well tolerated. So for most majority of people, just giving them levothyroxine synthetic T4, they're able to get improvement in their symptoms. There is a small portion of people who don't feel well on T4 alone. In those cases, we can add on a little bit of T3. So leothyronine, which is also called Cytomel. So T3 is, tends to be more potent. It has a variable and faster absorption. It has a faster half-life, so sometimes we do have to dose it twice a day. Um, there are other forms of thyroid hormone replacement like desiccated thyroid extracts. These are your armor thyroid, nature thyroid. So what these are, these are distilled from porcine or bovine sources. The thing with the uh, desiccated thyroid extracts is since they're distilled from porcine or bovine sources, they don't have the same ratio of T4 and T3 as that of a normal human thyroid. So a lot of times we prefer to add on T3 to T4 since we can control the ratio of T4 and T3. Um, so to talk about side effects and complications of treatment. So the only danger of taking thyroxine, of taking thyroid hormone, is caused by taking too little or too much. If you take too little, your hypothyroidism will continue. If you take too much, you'll develop the symptoms of hyperthyroidism, which is an overactive thyroid gland. So now I want to shift gears and talk about a little bit about hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism refers to any condition in which there's too much thyroid hormone produced in the body. In other words, the thyroid gland is overactive. Another term you may hear for this problem is thyrotoxicosis, which refers to high thyroid hormone levels in the bloodstream, irrespective of their source. So signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. So it's the opposite of hypothyroidism, where everything is kind of running a little bit fast. So you may notice weight loss, increased appetite, feeling hot all the time, diarrhea or loose, or loose stools, you may notice some sweating or moist skin, palpitations, arrhythmias, tremors, anxiety. Um, females will also notice, can notice abnormal periods. 
Um, you can have high blood pressure, muscle weakness, and then in Graves' disease, which is the most common um, cause of hyperthyroidism, you may also get this stare and lid lag. So what are the causes of hyperthyroidism? The most common cause is Graves' disease. Um, it's seen in more than 70% of people with hyperthyroidism. So it, Graves' disease is caused by antibodies in the blood that turn on the thyroid and cause it to grow and secrete too much thyroid hormone. So as you mentioned, thyroid hormone production, thyroid is under the control of the pituitary gland. So TSH is the only hormone that should be stimulating the thyroid to make thyroid hormone. In Graves' disease, the body makes um, antibodies that act like TSH and are constantly stimulating the thyroid gland to grow and to make thyroid hormone. So a lot of times people with Graves' disease will present with very enlarged thyroid glands and goiters. Other causes of hyperthyroidism could be a toxic nodular goiter or toxic adenoma. So you can, it's very common to get nodules in the thyroid gland. Sometimes these nodules kind of do their own thing and they make a lot of thyroid hormone. They don't listen to the pituitary. They're not under the control of the pituitary. They just keep spilling thyroid hormone, which can cause hyperthyroidism. Another, another cause of hyperthyroidism can be thyroiditis. What thyroiditis is, it's inflammation of the thyroid cells. So when you get inflammation of thyroid cells, the thyroid cells can burst open and they can dump their whole store of thyroid hormone into the bloodstream so you can get a transient hyperthyroidism. Another cause of hyperthyroidism can be if you're on too much treatment. So how do we diagnose hyperthyroidism? So again, the diagnosis is made through blood test by checking the levels of TSH, T4, and T3. In, in hyperthyroidism, you would expect the T4 and T3 to be high and the TSH will be low because the brain senses that there's too much thyroid hormone in the blood, so it decreases the level of TSH, trying to tell the thyroid not to make too much thyroid hormone. In Graves' disease, you can also see the presence of these thyrotropin receptor antibodies, which act like TSH to stimulate the thyroid. Um, other tests that we may order in hyperthyroidism is a thyroid ultrasound. In Graves' disease, we can see a very enlarged thyroid gland, a goiter. In toxic uh, multinodular goiter, we could see thyroid nodules present in the thyroid. Another test that we may or may not order is a radioactive exam. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. So as we mentioned, the thyroid gland takes up iodine the only organ in the body to use iodine. So what the radioactive uptake scan is, um, the patient swallows a pill of iodine that's been tagged with a radioactive isotope. So in a normal thyroid, you'll see in both lobes, you'll see um, diffuse uptake of the iodine molecule. In Graves' disease, you can see this intense uptake. So you can see here that the thyroid is enlarged and you see this intense uptake indicating that there's too much thyroid hormone production. In a toxic multinodular goiter where there are multiple nodules making thyroid hormone, you can see these nodules um, having increased uptake or you can see a single nodule in the thyroid that's making a lot of thyroid hormone. So this is also a useful test to help differentiate the different causes of hyperthyroidism. So how do we treat hyperthyroidism? So in Graves' disease, we have medications um, called methimazole or PTU. What these medications do is they inhibit the thyroid from making too much thyroid hormone. So they directly go into the thyroid and in inhibit the production of thyroid hormone. You can also treat hyperthyroidism with radioactive iodine treatment, um, where you give a iodine molecule that's tagged with a radioactive isotope, and that'll go and burn the thyroid cells. So this is a common treatment for Graves' disease or toxic nodules. Surgery is another option for hyperthyroid where you can remove the thyroid gland. Obviously, you will become hypothyroid after and need to go on thyroid hormone replacement. So surgery is used in cases of thyroid nodule in Graves where a patient is not a candidate for medications or radioactive iodine. 
So it's usually last resort. So just to go a little bit more in detail in, again about the blood work. So TSH being the key diagnostic test. If it's normal, then likely your thyroid's functioning fine. If it's high, then that's indicating that the thyroid gland isn't making enough thyroid hormone. So when we check free T4, if it's low, that's diagnostic. That, that cinches the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. If it's normal, then people usually fall in this in the category of subclinical hypothyroidism. And in that case, sometimes we can just monitor the symptoms. Um, if people have a lot of symptoms, then we can consider treating them to see if they feel better. When the TSH is low, that's indicating that um, the thyroid is overactive. So when you measure a free T4, if it's high, that that's, uh, suggests hyperthyroidism. If it's normal, again, you fall into the category of subclinical hyperthyroidism. And then we decide if that patient needs treatment based on their signs and symptoms. In conclusion, the thyroid is a deceptively simple organ with a beautiful complex control system. Iodine is its food. Hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism have many different causes. The above have many variable symptoms. The TSH is the key diagnostic test. Treatment can also be deceptively simple, but vital to feeling better and preventing side effects. So now we're going to move to um, questions. So I have your list of questions that um, have already been submitted, so I'll go through them. So the first question was, how important is iodine for your thyroid? I'm a vegetarian and don't eat seafood. Can a supplement be used? So again, as mentioned, iodine is very important for the thyroid. The daily requirements are 150 micrograms. Um, a lot of different foods have iodine, not just seafood, so nuts, um, milk, certain fruits, vegetables, and as mentioned, salt and flour are also supplemented. So likely you're able to get enough iodine in your diet, um, even if you're a vegetarian. Um, the next question is, is there a difference in performance between generic or brand name levothyroxine? So in theory, there shouldn't be because generic levothyroxine is the same active ingredient as brand. Anecdotally, some patients report that they feel better on a certain brand and that when they switch between brands or they switch to generic, they may notice some difference in their symptoms. But in theory, most they both have the same active ingredients, so there really shouldn't be much of a difference in performance. Um, and the follow up question is, what is my opinion of natural thyroid hormones? So again, a lot of the natural thyroid formulations are from pig and cow thyroid. And they tend to have a different T4 and T3 ratio that, than we see in humans. So a lot of times I prefer to add T3 on to the T4 that a patient's taking so we can control the ratio of T4 to T3 versus a lot of times in these um, natural thyroid preparations, we're not able to do that. Um, just of note also that in, pre in pregnancy, T3 is not approved as treatment since T3 cannot cross the placenta. So if someone was pregnant, we would only recommend being treated with levothyroxine, which is T4. Um, does Hashimoto's as an autoimmune disease affect response to COVID? So that's a good question. Um, as far as we can tell, no. Since it's not really suppressing your immune system, it's not, um, it shouldn't affect, shouldn't make you more predisposed to COVID or more predisposed to complications from COVID than the average population. Um, the other question is, does um, Hashimoto's make me more susceptible to diabetes and other autoimmune diseases? And the answer is yes. If you have one autoimmune disease, you may be predisposed to other autoimmune diseases. Um, but that's not always the case. There are a lot of women that just have Hashimoto's and don't have any other autoimmune diseases. But usually we can see that autoimmune diseases do tend to occur together. 
Um, the next question is, is there something called thyroid eye and what is it? So I think this question is referring to thyroid eye disease. So in Graves' disease, which is the most common cause of an overactive thyroid, you can get these um, thyroid antibodies that stimulate the thyroid can also bind the cells in the eye and it can cause um, it can cause hypertrophy of the fat cells and the muscle cells in the eye, leading to, um, you can get a lot of irritation in the eye, you can get bulging eyes, you can notice, um, you can have trouble with the muscles of the eyes. And a lot of times we treat that one by surgery, um, you can do eye drops, topical drops, and then we can also give steroids and certain immuno treatment, biological treatment for it. Um, so it's usually seen mostly in patients with Graves' disease, but not all patients with Graves' disease have thyroid eye disease. Usually it's a subset of patients with Graves. Um, how do I approach my primary care physician who might think that getting blood work or undergoing other tests to check the thyroid is unnecessary? So, I mean, I would just kind of have a discussion with the physician. I would go through and see, are you having any symptoms of an overactive and underactive thyroid? If you are, then you really should get a thyroid. You should get your thyroid levels checked, at least with a TSH. A TSH is a good screen is a good screening test. So if the TSH is normal, then likely the thyroid's functioning okay. But if it's abnormal, then you would want further testing to see if um, you have hypo or hyperthyroidism. Um, next question is: What symptoms arrive when thyroxine levels go down? So like we said, it kind of is associated with everything being slow. So you can notice feeling more sluggish, more tired, weight gain. Um, you can notice constipation, trouble concentrating, feeling more depressed. The symptoms are very variable. They're very nonspecific. A lot of times they overlap with um, other, other diseases. So a lot of times you usually do need a blood test to diagnose. Um, hypothyroidism. Um, the next question is, um, can you discuss adrenal fatigue? So, I mean, so adrenal fatigue is not really thought to be an actual medical diagnosis. Um, it's referring to, so a lot of times when people are stressed, when you're under a lot of stress for various reasons, your adrenal glands can respond by making too much cortisol hormone. So that's usually a normal response, and that can cause people to feel a little bit sluggish and not feel well. So a lot of times, the way to treat that is to try doing relaxation techniques, because um, it's your adrenal is doing what it's supposed to do. It's making extra cortisol to help you handle the stress. Um, so usually, it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily like a disease because you're it's kind of your adrenal glands doing what you do what it's supposed to do it's just usually the environment the stress that's stimulating it so a lot of times to help that it's control is trying to find ways to control the stress um the next question is um what causes the body to attack the thyroid um so a lot of times it's we don't really know why in some people the the body senses the thyroid to be an invader and attacks the thyroid there are different theories out there we're not sure if there's certain viral infection that can confuse the immune system to attack the thyroid or what exactly is it stress or something that triggers the immune system to all of a sudden attack the th think the thyroid glands an invader and attack it so people are still trying to understand that um, how would a damaged pituitary show up? So a lot of times when you check um, when you check blood work, if you notice someone has a low T4 and T3, you would expect the TSH to be high. If you see that the TSH is normal or low, then you'd be concerned that there may be something going on at the level of the pituitary. You could do further testing. The pituitary makes a lot of different hormones, not just TSH. So you can check for the other pituitary hormones like prolactin and FSH and LH, and it also controls your cortisol axis. You can check for ACTH and cortisol. So that's usually how we make the diagnosis of a damaged pituitary, whether there's something affecting the pituitary. 
once we see abnormal levels, then we could do imaging to get a better um, look at the pituitary gland. Um, the other question is, should people with Hashimoto's avoid iodized salt? Um, so again, too much and too or too little of iodine is bad. So you kind of want to make sure you're getting enough, which is like 150 micrograms. Um, usually most people are not getting too much iodine, so it probably is okay if you do use um, iodized salt. Um, another question was, can hyperthyroidism be caused by too much levothyroxine? And the answer is yes. Taking too much thyroid hormone, if you're overtreated with it, can give you symptoms of an overactive thyroid. The other question is, that can you take biotin for hair skin issues if you have hypothyroidism? So that's a good question. And the answer is yes, you can take biotin, but you have a lot of the assays that we use to diagnose thyroid disease, the TSH and the T4, they're biotinylated assays. So taking biotin can cause false readings in those blood tests. So a lot of times if people are on biotin for hair and skin, I usually ask them to hold their biotin two at least two days prior to going for thyroid blood work. Um, can a low TSH be caused by weight loss? So, um, so that's kind of, so there are two things. So if your thyroid's overactive, you can see a low TSH and one of the signs of, the signs of an overactive thyroid is weight loss. Um, sometimes if you've had, if you're sick or you've had drastic weight loss, you can get abnormalities in your thyroid levels. You can see a low TSH, which is what we call sick thyroid. We usually then have people repeat the level when they're feeling um, better. So those were all the questions I had. Um, not sure if anyone has any other questions. Dr. Narwani, there's a couple more questions. Okay. Um, are thinning eyebrows a symptom of low thyroid? Actually, yes, that's a good point, and I should have mentioned that. So you can notice um, hair loss, and noticing hair loss in the eyebrows, especially on the side of the eyebrows, can be a common sign of hypothyroidism. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. A um, couple more questions, sorry. Um, what causes someone who has hypothyroidism TSH level goes down and start to show hyperthyroidism symptoms? So a lot of the times you worry if you're being overtreated for your hypothyroidism, so if you're on too much levothyroxine. A lot of um, levothyroxine is usually weight-based, so if someone has had a drastic change in their weight, you, they may notice that their dose, um, they may need a change in their dose. Thank you. Um, can nodules cause hyperthyroidism? Yes. So majority of nodules don't make too much thyroid hormone, but 10% of thyroid nodules can be overactive and they can they can make too much thyroid hormone causing hyperthyroidism. Okay, and just last two questions. Um, first one is, could you still have a thyroid disorder if TSH level is normal? So yes, you can have, um, you can have um, Hashimoto's where you can get inflammation of the thyroid, but it's not severe enough that it's reflecting in the blood work. Um, so if you have a strong family history of thyroid disease, you can always check with thyroid antibodies to see. A lot of times we don't need to treat you if your TSH is normal, but we would just need to monitor you more closely. You can also have thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer and still have a normal TSH level. And the final question, um, is it important to avoid iodine in the diet if you have Graves' disease? Um, so you wanna, so it's usually people aren't getting that much iodine from their diet with Graves, but you wanna be careful with iodine contrast, like when you get imaging and stuff, that's a heavy iodine load and that can make the symptoms a little bit worse. So we don't so much worry so much about um, iodine from the diet because you don't, I mean, you'll absorb a certain amount from food, but not enough to make so much difference in your symptoms. But um, with high iodine doses, like you get through IV contrast, yes. And with that, I believe that's the last question. 
Um, thank you so much, Dr. Narwani, for your informative presentation this evening.